Guys, hey, guys, when I was young, uh, which, I mean, some of you are looking at me, you're like, bro, you're still young. I know, okay, I can't grow any facial hair. I know I look 12. I'm not actually 12. But when I was younger, uh, I had a dream, y'all. Like, has anybody ever just had, like, one of those young kid dreams where, like, you're sold out, you're all in, you're going to be it. Like, that is what I'm going to do when I'm older. Like, I had a dream, y'all. And uh, some of you may know this, actually probably very few of you know this, I wanted to be, with everything in me, a professional race car driver. Like, with everything in me. So I was like, I was pretty interested in cars growing up. I remember like the very uh, first thing I ever asked my mom for when we were at the, uh, like the drugstore, you know, the magazine rack, I saw this beautiful DuPont registry magazine and it had a red Ferrari on the front. And I was like, Mom, I want that magazine. And she was like, um, it's it's like literally a sales magazine for like $500,000 cars. And I'm like a 12-year-old kid at this point. She's like, uh, sure. So I just started like studying cars and like my parents probably wanted to punch me in the face every time we were in the car together because I'd be like, oh my gosh, there's a Ford Mustang. There's a, and I would like just name everything and they're like, Derek, it's, it's fine. But I wanted, I wanted to be a race car driver so badly. And so I got my first car. It was great. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys know what autocross is, but it's this, this kind of racing where they set up a big cone course in the middle of like an open parking lot. It's, I mean, it sounds really, really lame, but it's awesome. Trust me. And uh, the nationals of autocross every year are held at Air Park, like the Nationals. People come from all over the nation to race. And me and my friends, uh, as soon as we were 16, able to drive ourselves out, like we were there every year. And I would go and I would see like anything from these like little like 1990 Honda Civics to like Dodge Vipers and Lamborghini. It was like everything was racing. And I was a guy who, I had a 1990 Honda Civic. And I was like, I could do this. I could absolutely do this. And so I like, I had this, this vision. I was like, this is where I want to go. I was like, I will sell everything that I have, which I was like 16 years old. I didn't have anything to sell. Um, so that was out. Uh, like I will do whatever it takes to get here. So I actually bought myself like this little racing simulator, like the steering wheel had like force feedback. I got pretty good at that little racing simulator. And, uh, but, but ultimately, guys, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I never have raced in a single race in my entire life. Not once. <laughs> like, to this day, like, I just, I, I, I knew so, like, I knew so clearly where I wanted to be. I, like, I saw these guys racing and standing outside their cars and talking. I was like, this is so cool. And, uh, but I was a 16-year-old kid with no job and a 1990 Honda Civic with rust on every single quarter panel. And actually, I got new suspension for my car at one point, and when we took off the old suspension, the springs, I don't know if any of you guys know anything about cars. I'll be honest, I really don't either. I just like driving them, so don't ask me. I, like, I'm such a poser. But uh, so we, 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 and I say we, I mean someone else, and I was there, because again, I don't work on them. So someone took the springs off of my car, and they came off in like four pieces. Like, that, I probably should be dead at this point from driving that car anywhere. But anyway, I knew exactly where I wanted to be. I was like, that is it. But I had absolutely no idea how to get there. I was like, man, like, I've got the car. I could, I could learn to race on a racing simulator but I, I knew nothing about the organization. I, and I, and I'll, honestly, guys, I mean, it's probably a little bit on me. I didn't take any time to learn how to get there. I just, I was like, I, I want to just be there. Boom. Anyway. But I, I began to, for the first time in my, in my life, realize that there was a very, very wide gap from where I was, which I would call here, and where I wanted to be, which I'll call there. So there was, I, I noticed that there was a wide distance between here and there, and we've been reading through John chapter 4, and I think that that's where this woman finds herself in this story. But also, before we go any further, I think that's where a lot of us in life find ourselves. Because as I've been just pouring over this story, one of the things that I've realized is this woman's story, I mean, truly is my story. Like, her, the, uh, everything that she goes through in this, I can point back to a time in my life 
where I remember walking through, albeit in a different way. But, but this story, it really, is, it really is my story. And so I just want to, let's go real quick. We'll, we'll catch up on a little bit. We're going to jump backwards. I know we've been moving forward in this scripture, but to wrap it up this week, I want to jump backwards. And we're going to read John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 10 through 16. John chapter 4, verses 10 through 16. Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you. Man, we could just stop there and go home. If you only knew, the, do you guys know that God has something for you this morning? That God has something that he wants to pour into your life this morning right here? If you only knew the gift God had for you and who it was you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. The woman starts to argue, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob? Spoiler alert, he was. Like, can we, can we just take a moment and like realize like how weird this is? This, this lady is having an argument with God. Like, don't laugh, you've done it before too. But, uh, but who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and animals enjoy? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks from this well will be thirsty again. But those who drink from the water I give will never be thirsty again, and it will become a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water and I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here. Actually, another version says I won't have to keep coming here. Hey, who taught you that you have to keep coming here to get water? Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I know that's a really weird place to end, but uh, that's where I want to end, and, uh, and we will get to that. But basically, Jesus paints this fulfilling picture for her. He says, hey, I have something for you that you will never be thirsty again. And this lady's thinking about all the times that she's gone to this well, and she's like, okay, I'm in. I want it. He painted a picture for, uh, of a there for her that she wasn't currently that was different from her here. And she began to realize that there was a distance between where she was and where God had for her. And again, I think that that some of us find ourselves here. And I'll be honest, this was the story of my life growing up. I grew up in a Christian home. I have amazing parents who love the Lord. uh, And I would have told people my whole life, man, I love the Lord. He's great. Even at, even, at, uh, even at college parties, when I had drank too much, I would tell people, man, I love the Lord, but it wouldn't come out. But like, no, I didn't. <laughs> I thought I did. I mean, you know, I, I thought I was somewhere, but I realized that there was actually a greater distance than I had thought previously. So I just have three thoughts uh, for you today. And these aren't necessarily points, but these are three thoughts that I really want to encourage us to delve into together today. Three thoughts on bridging the distance between here and there. Three thoughts on bridging the distance between here and there. So, number one, to get there, we must first identify here. To get there, we must first identify. Do we have any American Idol fans in here? One or two hands, that's okay. Okay, so who has seen American Idol? That's maybe a better question. Wonderful, absolutely. I, uh, I used to watch American Idol, and then they changed all the judges, and I was sad, and it was no longer worth watching. But... I think uh, if, if American Idol were to be a, a, a who taught you that sermon, I think it would probably be called who taught you that you could sing, right? How many times people go in there, they walk in, they're confident, they're like, mm-hmm, do you think you're the next American Idol? I know I'm the next American Idol. I have got this. And then they open their mouth and you're like, oh man, like who taught them that they could sing? Obviously no one. But that, you know, they had those people in their life who were like, you're so good, keep singing, keep doing it. No, don't keep singing. Like they are completely unaware of where they actually are. They think they're amazing and it's great and wonderful. I'm sure they're wonderful at some other things. Singing is not it. Singing is not it. And and, and guys, how often do we find ourselves there? When we realize we're like, okay, so I'm going to just write on this here real quick. Okay, great. Here. So to get there, we must first identify what? Here. This is not a you are here map. It's just the word here on a piece of poster board. So, here. But a lot of us are very just not aware of where our here is. Like I said, much like me when I was in college, thinking that I was this sold out person for the Lord and just getting wasted on the weekends, but arguing with people about who God was at a party. Like, I thought I was somewhere, but I really wasn't. And honestly, most of the time, if I was really real with myself, I didn't think I was there. I was pretending. <laughs> and can I tell you something? God can't heal who you pretend to be. 
God cannot heal who you pretend to be. So I want to ask us today, can we take off the mask? Can we be real? Can we be honest, open, and vulnerable before the Lord? Because God has something for you today. God has something for you every day, actually. And it's the fulfilling life that Jesus painted for this woman. But she was absolutely unaware of where she actually was. She thought that she had it all figured out, as evidenced by the fact that she was arguing with God, right? Amen. She thought that she had it all figured out. And the reason that I actually read all the way to the end of it, because, again, she thought he was talking about this physical well. Hey, why do you, like, I'll give you water. Like, he wasn't talking about water. He wasn't talking about, and we'll get to that later, but, but she was, like, just so confused. So at the end, that's why he said, hey, go get your husband. Go get your husband. And she goes on to have this conversation with him. She's like, I don't have a husband. Gotcha. He's like, I know. You've had five. The guy you're living with now is not your husband. But what, he real, what, what, what that revealed to her is that she was going to an internal well. She kept coming to a specific place because she thought that she would find fulfillment in husbands. How many of y'all who are married know that you don't find fulfillment in husbands and wives? It's really great. It can be an addition to your life, but if that is your fulfillment, you're going to find yourself thirsty. And I don't know what your here is, but I have a little bit of a, a way that I can kind of maybe clarify it for you a little bit. Your here is normally marked by a desperate desire that leads to temporary fulfillment and leaves you empty and wanting more. I'm going to say that again. Your here is normally marked by a desperate desire, okay? Maybe it's, hey, I just want to be married. It leads to temporary fulfillment. It's really good for the first couple weeks. And then you realize that that person that you linked yourself to actually can't fill the void that was in your heart in the first place. Or maybe, hey, I just want to forget. Okay, so I'm going to pick up a bottle and I'm going to start drinking and temporarily I'm going to forget what it was that was bringing my, me pain, but I'm going to wake up in the morning hurting a whole lot more and remembering it more than I ever did beforehand. Hey, maybe it's, I just want to be liked. Any people pleasers in the room? I'm raising my hand higher than any of you. And then you realize that everybody likes you but one person. And that one person drives you crazy because it's not enough. What is your here? What is it for you? Can I tell you a surefire way to find out? Just like this woman did. Get alone with Jesus. Get alone with Jesus. When you find yourself sitting one-on-one with Jesus opening your heart to him, even if you argue a little bit. Guess what? Jesus wasn't put off by her arguments. But he was faithful to point out what was really in her. She thought the deficit was water. (laughs) He showed her that the deficit was relationships. So where is here for you? Where is here for you? And can I, as before we move on to this, the second point, can I, can I point something out? Your here doesn't disqualify you. Your here doesn't count you out. Guess what Jesus didn't do? He didn't shame her. He didn't make her feel guilty. He just stated it. Hey, this is actually where you are. That's not cruel. That is a picture of love. God wants to point out in your heart, hey, this is where you really are. Because if we can't identify where we really are, we can't move to where God wants us to be. Okay. To identify, no, to get there, we must first identify here. You ready? This is going to be profound. You guys ready for this? Number two, to get there, we must then identify there. Who knew, right? Okay, there. We're going to write there up here. Aren't you guys so glad I'm an artist? I was actually thinking about like, before this, like talking about vision, being like an artist can see a canvas and then they can see what will be there and they can figure it out. And then I, you guys would have expected me to do some art for you. And that's all I got. So we're going to just, <laughs> we're going to leave it there, but uh, that's fine. So gosh, where is there? Where is there? So Jesus was point, painting this picture for her. And I want to go back to the first thing that Jesus said in chapter, in, uh, in verse 10, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God had for you, and who it is you're speaking to, you'd ask, and I give you living water. And uh, 
to her, that literally made no sense because he was like, she, she's like, okay, we're at a well. He's talking about water. And I think that for some of us, that might be where we find ourselves right now. Like, okay, that sounds kind of strange and kind of weird. Jesus taught in parables a lot. He taught in words that to a lot of people didn't really make much sense. But the beautiful thing about the Bible is that it can interpret itself. There's a lot of wonderful places in the Bible that the Bible interprets the Bible. So we are going to just break down there of what Jesus was pointing out to her. So we're going to start with that very first part that says, if you only knew the gift God has for you. If you want to write this down, it'll be up here, but James 1, verse 17. You ready? James 1, verse 17. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift. Someone say gift. Coming down to us from who? God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens, and he never changes or casts a shifting shadow. All right. So the first part of this there, can I tell you what it is? It's access to the Father. It's access to the Father. Jesus said, hey, if you only knew the gift that God, the Father, has for you. He didn't say if you only knew the gift that God could have for you. Keep in mind, this lady didn't even know who Jesus was, and he was still saying, you have access to what God has for you. That's a good day. And guys, we're talking about this there being a place where our soul can find contentment and fulfillment. The next part of that verse said that the Father never changes or casts a shifting shadow. How many of you guys know if you're going to find your fulfillment in something, it dang well better be something that doesn't change. Because if it changes, you will lose all contentment. The Father never changes. Okay, the first thing that we have is access to our Father. The next thing that he says is, if you only knew that, and who it is you're speaking to. Who is she speaking to? Jesus. Great. So if you only knew Jesus, what's the second part to this? If we have access to the Father through relationship with Jesus, John chapter 1 verse 12 says this, but to all who believed him, Jesus, and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Can I tell you something? If you accept Jesus as who he says he is and you believe on him, you do not only have the opportunity to become a member of the family of God. You have the right. Guys, that's good news. And we always talk about relationship with Jesus, and I think that we boil that down to like just this numb thing that we don't really know what we have access to. It's not just relating with Jesus. We are related to Jesus. The thing says, the Bible says that we become co-heirs of Christ. It's not just a friendship. It is a familial relationship where what Jesus has coming to him from the Father, we are now included in. That is good news, you guys. Come on. We have relationship with Jesus. And most of us stop right there. And you're like, oh, man, what's the matter with that? That's really good. It is. These are the only two aspects of God that I ever knew about growing up. And can I tell you something? I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. Because, man, when we pray to, when we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father, where? In heaven. Hallowed be your name. Okay, Jesus, he resurrected, and then what happened? He ascended to be at the right hand with the Father. Well, dang. I'm still right here. I'm not there. I'm right here. And if those are the only two aspects of the character of God that you know about, like me, you're going to find yourself really frustrated because you're going to begin to realize the painful distance between where you are and where you believe God wants you to be. But you don't know how to get there. And this was me. I believed in Jesus my whole life. I believed in God my whole life. And I will, I will stand on that. I, I believe that I believed in it, but I did not think it was personal. I thought it was so distant. I thought it was so far. And you know, when I was told, okay, well, as soon as you pray that sinner's prayer, you're going to heaven. So I was like, okay, I'm going to heaven, but like, what about now? And I didn't experience any goodness from God, or so I thought. And so I just started acting out. And I started, you know, doing a lot of really 
dumb stuff, but the one thing that I really leaned into was an addiction to pornography. Because I felt broken. I, I knew that there was this, this broken place in my soul that needed healing, but I didn't think that God had it. I thought that it was found in relationships. And so, man, from a young age, I was exposed to pornography, and I just kept going back. I just kept going back, and I didn't even think it was a big deal. I mean, people will, will talk about that in this society, like, oh, yeah, who doesn't watch porn? Whatever. And it devastated me. I didn't know how to interact with people. <laughs> um, I didn't know how to interact with women. I sure didn't treat women well. I didn't know how to be a man. <laughs> because I kept going back to this thing that left me empty. Because even though I believed in God, I thought God was distant. I thought he was just far off. I said, okay, God, I'm looking forward to there. But I'm just going to enjoy here while I've still got it. And I didn't. <laughs> I'll tell you that. If you, if you try to enjoy here that way, or any way that's a substitute, because that's really what it was. It was just a substitute for God's presence here. You're going to find yourself empty. And one and more. There's good news, people. I promise you there's good news. John chapter 7, 37 through 39. You ready for this? This is Jesus. On the last day of the climax of the festival, Jesus should and stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. I needed that. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink for the scriptures declare. Here he says it again. Rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Like what does that mean? Go to the next verse. When he said living water, come on, I love the Bible. He was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered his glory. Guys, you can't have a relationship with Jesus without the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't. It's impossible. The Bible says God is Spirit. If he's Spirit, we've got to have something spiritual inside of us interacting with him. All right, it's good. We know what it is. Can I tell you another great thing about the Holy Spirit? Can we, John 14, verse 26. John 14, verse 26. But when the Father sends the advocate, great, we have access to the Father, every good and perfect gift. Okay, great. As my representative, Jesus says, okay, through we have access through a relationship with Jesus, that is the Holy Spirit. He will what? He will teach you everything and remind you of what I have told you. Who taught you that? If it wasn't the Holy Spirit, you better get it out of your mind. Come on, we have someone who will teach us. It says later, he will lead us into all truth. Who is truth? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The Holy Spirit resides in you to teach you more about who Jesus is. And you can't relate to him without him. You'll read a Bible and you'll think it's gibberish. Because guess what the Bible also says about itself? That the letter without the Spirit, brings death. If you try to just read the Bible without an illuminated mind, you will be so frustrated because it makes no sense without the Spirit as your interpreter. Great, okay, all of this is good to know. Wonderful. Point three, how do I get there? going to draw some more. All right. I'm going to read my Bible. These are stairs. I'll have to, I'm going to have to translate. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will not teach you what my art is. I just want you to know that. So I will. Those are stairs. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, I am going to go to church on Sunday. Great. Oh, man. We're getting closer, guys. I am going to... I got a little goosebump. I'm going to raise my hand in worship. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Man, that one gets you real far. That one gets you real close to heaven. Let me tell you that. I'm even going to join a Bible study. Oh, yeah. Guys, we're there. No, we're not. We're still here. We're still here. Some of us have relegated our relationship with God to doing all the stuff. 
and we find ourselves at the bottom of this insurmountable staircase, and we still see there at the top, but now it just looks harder to get to. How do I get there? I've got bad news for you, friends. You can't. So stop trying. And before I finish, can I finish my story with you guys? I found myself so frustrated with here that I tried everything. And I remember so clearly when I was 22 years old, I was living by myself. I went home and I had a conversation with my mom and I was a mess. I was telling her how depressed I was. That honestly, I didn't want to wake up. I didn't want life to keep going on. Because if this is what life is, who wants it? I was frustrated. My mom was so sweet. She kept pointing me to Jesus. She kept pointing me to Jesus. And I didn't listen. I remember driving home that night just crying in my car. And I prayed, I think, probably for the first time in my life, authentically. And I was mad. Because I knew I tried everything. Yeah. I just said, God, if you're real, would you just show up? Guess what happened on that ride? Nothing. But about three days later, I was sitting in my room all by myself. This video on YouTube came up. It was a TED Talk about porn addiction. That's where I was. It's my here. It was not spiritual. If you want to watch it at some point, if you, I don't, I'll probably tell you what it is if you ask me, but like it probably won't hit you like it hit me. And during that video, the guy started saying, word for word, the words out of my mouth that I had said to my mom a few nights before. And God arrested my heart. I knew in that moment, I didn't work my way to God. He met me. So the good news, friends, you can't get there. But he will meet you here. Because 2,000 years ago, God himself stepped out of heaven. He put on the suit of a human. He became limited. The unlimited God of the universe chose to limit himself for you. And what he did is he died on a cross. And what happened when he died on the cross, it says that the veil in the temple that was what was supposed to keep God's presence from people tore in two symbolizing now that we have full access. You can't get there. But can I tell you something? Here is there. Because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because of the veil that no longer exists, and because of the Holy Spirit that reigns on this earth, here is there. And you can't get it by working. But I can tell you how you can. It's in the same verse that we started with. Jesus says, if you only knew the gift God had for you, and now I think we do, and who it is you're talking to, I'm related by blood, I'm in the family of God, then he goes on to say, then you would ask, and I'll give you living water. Would you stand to your feet? That's all that it takes. It doesn't take work. It doesn't take effort. It takes an asking. So tonight, I'm not going to, or this morning, I'm not going to go through and and ask you to, to raise your hands or anything like that because honestly, where I encountered God was a very strange moment. But it was with an invitation. So we're going to sing a song together. And the words are so simple but it's an invitation for God to meet us where we are. 
The words are, hey, I'm, God, I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? And I think the word again is important because for some of you, this may be the first time you've ever prayed this, but for some of you, you've been there before, but you've walked away. Or you've started going back to the same here. And I tell you, he'll still meet you here. And then the end, it says, come Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. So guys, this is your moment. I know that it doesn't look like a normal moment, but this is your moment. I'm gonna walk off stage and it's just you and the Lord. He will meet you here. Guess what? You can't get there, but he will meet you here. Come on, let's worship. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? And not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come Holy Spirit. Dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit. Dry bones awaken. place. The Lord is in this place. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you here again. Father, we just thank you that you meet us where we are. It doesn't matter if we're in our car, in our bedroom, in our house, in our living room, at the church, in the nursery, wherever we're at, God, whatever we're doing, because of what you sent Jesus to do, your Holy Spirit is able to be with us no matter what. And so God, I just pray that you would meet us, that you would continue to meet us throughout this day. Lord, that we would never feel alone because we know that your presence is is with us. We know that you're for us and not against us. We know that you're with us. And God, I just thank you for this time that we've had together. I thank you for your power and your anointing, God. I pray that you would use us in a mighty way this week. In Jesus' name, 